good afternoon uh, thank you for all being here my name is pushkar sohoni i teach in the humanities and social sciences department here at icer pune and on behalf of icer pune it's my great privilege to welcome and introduce dr sharad lele who will be talking to us about water and how we should think about it he got his btech from the university of bombay and decided to uh, not pursue a career in engineering but decided uh, that studying the social impact of dams and water systems was more important and therefore went on to do an ms and then a phd from berkeley he now works at atri and i do have in my hand a list of uh, very impressive affiliations that he has with leading institutes all through the world but let me not bore you with that because i guess about half the audience knows him and of course if you do wish to know that come and see me after the talk and i'll be very happy to share this piece of paper with you but since we are already late in the interests of time uh, just join me in welcoming dr lee thank you pushkar and uh, it's good that you didn't go through the whole life history because uh, it's mostly a life history of a journey where i keep shifting my interest as i go along and a btech in electrical engineering now seems really remote and uh, far away so it's a real pleasure for me I, although i'm a pune kar this is my first visit to icer pune so this is an extra sort of uh, uh, incentive for me to accept the invitation that i got and of course there are a whole bunch of uh, familiar faces in the audience possibly of outnumbering the icer students nevertheless uh, to uh, keeping in mind that icer is the is my host and my those who have invited me so i i pitched the talk uh, to icer students primarily and therefore if many of the experts many of the people who have worked here uh, in the water sector for 40 years 50 years of their life they might find this extremely elementary and and uh, possibly superficial i beg their forgiveness right in the beginning because as i said i'm pitching this talk to a slightly different audience which may or may not be familiar with uh, all the nuances of the water sector that one cannot capture in a uh, 45 minute to 1 hour talk so please excuse me for that um on the contrary it's possible still that i may not have gauged my uh, student audience correctly so please feel free i'm saying this to the students who might be feeling a little shy and at the in the back benches um if you have any questions right in the middle if there's something not very clear please raise your hand and just uh, stop me right then and there this is not a formal lecture or anything it's more like sharing uh, a certain way of looking at the water problem uh, with many people uh, including people in this room so my first slide is really about acknowledgments because this cannot be the effort of one person to try to understand such a complex problem so colleagues before i joined atri including joy who was with us at sisaid and and several others who informed uh, my work or my understanding of the water sector uh <coughs> colleagues at atri including bijoy thomas who's now bijoy where are you who's actually now a faculty at at icer and probably triggered this uh, uh invitation to me uh, vina shrinivasan priyanka jamwal and uh, jagdish krishna swami just to name some of the colleagues working in the water sector and colleagues in a task group on water policy that the uh, karnataka knowledge commission had set up a couple of years ago uh, and it was a group of 20 people in the task group but we actually then managed to set up sub groups which had himanshu kulkarni from uh, pune mihir shah was uh, chairing the task group uh, as you know he's uh, an eminent water person also and we had a variety of scholars who also contributed to uh, making that report possible and that one year two year process i was the member secretary of this task group really was a huge learning for me also in terms of understanding the water sector particularly in karnataka so i'd like to acknowledge the contributions that these and other other colleagues have made throughout the last 20 years that i've try to engage with the water sector a little bit um i'd like to begin by saying at some level you know for all of us the water problem is very obvious and palpable and last year those of you who were in maharashtra or in pune and something the narrative may be, may have been more about something like this right even even northern karnataka the narrative the story the headlines the newspapers tv everything was about flooding everything was about excess rainfall and crazy rains and so on and so forth and and you know collapsing electrical lines or whatever it is so this was a, a major narrative however if you take a slightly longer time span last 10 years or so the major narrative has been uh, a different one the opposite one the one of drying rivers uh, the narrative of drying irrigation tanks in 
Karnataka, which prides itself on having 23,000 irrigation tanks, but most of them today are probably dry and now are being attempted to be filled by lifting water from some other river and, and feeding them into these tanks. So, some crazy initiatives on that front. And of course, the third dimension, which is uh, disappearing groundwater. And this is a narrative. Open wells are almost a, a novelty now these days, functioning open wells. <clears throat> Everything is about, uh, uh, you know, bore wells and it's about whether I can drill deeper than you can. So, uh, in Kolar district of, of, of Karnataka, the groundwater has reached 2000 feet. And, you know, the number of functioning bore wells is probably 10, 20 percent of the total number of bore wells that have been drilled uh, over the last uh, few decades. So, this is the larger narrative of, of a water scarce country, uh, especially a water scarce peninsula, which does not have perennial rivers like the uh, ones that originate in the Himalayas. And added to that, we have the narrative of water pollution, which is humongous amount of and of course, the Ganga story is, is known to everybody, but you can go to any particularly any river which has an urban center on its on its banks and you will see this this kind of a story. This is the Vrishwabhati that originates in Bangalore and, and therefore, has become from a seasonal clean river to a perennial sewer uh, that takes out even at in the peak of summer, it flows at 600 million liters per day, which is the sewage that it is removing from Bangalore or that part of Bangalore. So, that is the story and in its extreme form, you have now videos like this. Or, or the snapshot going viral across the world. So, I was in University of Waterloo a few years ago and people may not know exactly where Bangalore is in which continent. We say, oh, the place which has foaming lakes. So, Vartur Lake, for example, this foam that was climbing several uh, stories high had become like a video that had gone viral and, and people identified Bangalore with that. So, uh, these are the narratives that we have of, of polluted water and, and uh, especially of water scarcity. So, the question is, uh, do not we have, you know, solutions. But before we come to solutions, I would like to unpack the problem. This is more for a, a, a science institute audience because very often we struggle to understand the water problem in the sense what exactly is the role of a scientist vis-a-vis uh, uh, understanding and solving water problem. It is kind of useful to take that step back and unpack the idea of a problem a little bit more. Um, so, in science, we think of problems as puzzles. You know, it could be Fermat's last theorem, it could be, you know, the origin of muons or it could be something else as a sort of a puzzle that needs to be solved. These are close ended problems, they have an answer and we are kind of used to thinking of them as value neutral uh, to be solved by particular disciplines who frame those problems uh, and that is kind of what the normal scientist's job is. However, in the real world, when we come to, when we say a water problem, it has a very different meaning. We are using the word problem in a particularly different way from the idea of a puzzle and what we mean there is really a problem because somebody is bothered by it. It is hurting somebody in some sense. And when we say it is hurting somebody, that means there are some value uh, judgments involved there. What is hurt is, you know, if the river is not clean enough, but I never drink that water, then is that really hurt because my sense of aesthetics is disturbed. So, we have a whole bunch of values associated with water with its, you know, why we want water in a particular form and place. And therefore, the real world problem is never free of, of values uh, in its definition. And in, we need multiple disciplines in their explanation and then we need a transdisciplinary approach to their solution. And using the word transdisciplinary here in a particular way that some uh, literature uses it, may, namely bridging science with action or a science with practice. So, we need to do all three of these and un unpack the values, uh, be interdisciplinary in our, in our explanation of the problem and then looking for the solution in a much more interactive way with practitioners. So, it is in this sense that we are, we are thinking about the water problem, this sense that we need to actually engage with it. And this is a tricky place to be for a pure scientist or a scientist, even an applied scientist. What does it mean to do work in this kind of a value loaded arena where uh, subjectivity then becomes really very, very powerful and, and significant uh, and how do we engage with that. So, I just like to sort of illustrate that problem a little bit more by saying uh, a way to understand or unpack this, this uh, presence of uh, multiple disciplines of uh, normativity. Uh, and so on in environmental problems in general would be to start with the list of phenomena. So, instead of talking about water problems, if we try to take away words which are pejorative or words which hint at already a negative connotation of some kind and, and use words like river flows are changing. So, my earlier slide was about rivers declining, flows are declining. So, if we just said river flows were changing, uh, groundwater levels were changing, um, you know, lakes were foaming, you know, try to keep a very neutral uh, wording on that and some species were disappearing, reappearing, you know, dolphin, Gangetic dolphins were perhaps gone and that is just part of species change. This puts a very neutral term 
on on description of phenomena out there that are happening but then we should be asking then we can ask the question why do we care why do we care if the gangrenic dolphin is gone or the you know river flow has become less than it was last year or or the groundwater level is you know 50 feet lower or whatever and to answer that question we need to convert the phenomenon into a problem through a lens and we cannot really convert a phenomenon into problem unless we have a lens on our eyes in terms of how we look at that particular phenomenon and the value lenses could be of multiple kinds it could be because we care about our immediate material well being so i don't have enough water in the well how do i make it through summer which is a reality in the place where i live for example uh, it might be because it hurts my sense of aesthetic value it might be my sense of justice it might be my sense of you know future generations needs uh, and sacredness and so on and so forth so it's only when we associate a value with a, a process or a phenomenon that we then come up with a problem definition as to why why this is actually something that it's worth investigating and trying to rectify um and then we can look at the question of where does this problem originate what's driving this problem and we might say through some biophysical process or technology it might be dams that have come up on the river upstream it might be because of bore wells that we have drilled like crazy all across the landscape uh, or what have you and we may have some biophysical explanations in the sense of the technology or the biophysical manner of using that resource or dumping effluents in that resource uh, we might also have behind that biophysical process again some uh, natural explanations it might be climate change that is uh, driving this drying of the river it might be something else that's happening out there maybe some volcanic uh, activity or tectonic movements uh, but by and large it's going to be really anthropogenic and not just uh, driven by nat natural processes and so we would have to look at what individual decisions actually led to these uh, uh these biophysical processes that led to those those uh, negative impacts and the social structures that then drive those individual decisions and this is a way to understand the role of different disciplines uh, uh and we can also have a feedback from those changes but coming to the role of different disciplines so the, the role of the natural sciences and engineering is explaining the link between human actions and biophysical outcomes uh, the role of the social and behavioral sciences is to explain what individual decisions uh, you know and why they happened in some sense that drove those those uh, changes uh, and the role of philosophy ethics and decision sciences in a sense is to explicate what values actually matter or don't matter or how we can uh, uh, better nuance our understanding of the the problem the lens through which we are looking at the phenomenon and what then trade offs are more reasonable less reasonable more ethical less ethical in terms of whose values matter whose values can be ignored and so on and so forth so i think this this might be a way of for us to understand the role of different disciplines and how they interact in understanding all environmental problems uh, including the water problem the solving therefore will involve taking value positions uh, analyzing so natural and social causality and of course given that we can never fully analyze causality adopting certain world views in the face of uncertainty uh, and then finally if you want to actually solve them explanations are not going to be enough so you have to actually do some engineering uh, which is not the same as science because science can explain but not solve so to solve those problems you will need to do some both uh, physical or biological engineering but also a lot of social engineering and i use that in a very loose and and uh, uh, soft sense in the sense some form of social change and it can take very different forms depending upon your predilection um, so i'd like to begin by asking the question what are the values associated with with uh, the water sector and i put up this slide of the sustainable development goals because now that's the buzzword everybody talks about sdgs and sdg 6 is supposedly about water and when you read the details of sdg 6 it's 6 is further broken down into six sub goals and the first one is all have access to safe and affordable drinking water sanitation and then uh, water quality will improve by reducing pollution and and having the proportion of untreated wastewater and these three actually look like goals you're actually setting yourself up to do something saying by some 2030 we will have done this this and this it's actually in the form of a goal um if you look at the next two they they are not really form of goals they are more in the form of strategies so increasing water efficiency can't be a goal it can be a strategy to then achieving something and there at the end of it say reduce the number of persons suffering from water scarcity so the goal is to reduce the number of people they don't tell you half they don't tell you anything because they don't actually tell you what water scarcity they are talking about if it was drinking water then you already address that problem here why are you why are you repeating it there um and the sixth, fifth one is really completely about process it says we'll do some form of integrated water resource management which uh, looks at water resources holistically and somehow magically by doing this uh, integrated management 
we will actually have achieved some goal, but not clear what goal it is that we are trying to achieve. Which of these goals really is achieved by that? Uh, and then finally, we have uh, uh, protecting and restoring ecosystems, including mountains, forests, uh, and then it's not clear is this a goal or is this means to some other goal. So, is protection a good thing in itself, or are we doing it for some other reason? And what that uh, what that other reason might be. So, I put a dotted line on uh, around that particular goal, and I'm. When we talk to people in the water sector, when we work in the water sector, it seems to us that this is really a very lopsided or partial set of goals. And when you think about even in Maharashtra, if you ask somebody who is sort of been reading the newspapers a little bit and tracking the water crisis, especially during times of scarcity, and ask them what is the biggest debate or what are some of the big hot issues uh, being debated in Maharashtra. And Joy is sitting right in the middle of the room and he will say it is the sharing of water between agriculture and, and urban or agriculture and industry. And particularly within agriculture between sugarcane farmers and the rest of agriculture. So, sugarcane farming in Western Maharashtra is seen, seen very clearly as part of the problem, the part of you know who got, gets water and who they, therefore does not get water. So, the sharing of water within agriculture and between sectors, agriculture and other sectors is a huge part of the question of what is the right way to manage water. But that sharing question is not at all visible here in any sense that how do we share water is not a question that is posed here. And the question of sharing and therefore questions of uh, what I call biophysical and social justice are actually absolutely central to water, but somehow missing from the SDG 6 formulation of, of the goals for the water sector, which is you know you could start with equity even within a sector. Uh, and I just want to highlight that with this with this slide of uh, analysis that we did for Bangalore. So if you look at this histogram for domestic water use in the city of Bangalore, and this was a collaboration with Deepak Malgan from IM Bangalore. Um, what this histogram is telling us is that the mean consumption of water in Bangalore is 120 liters per capita per day, which seems pretty reasonable given that the official norm is 135 or whatever it is. But the median, which is your 50 percentile mark, is below 90, it is at 85, right? Which means half the population is actually consuming below 90 LPCD and it goes down all the way till 25. So, uh, you have got people consuming anywhere from 25 to 90 LPCD, uh, that is half the population. And the other half is above 90, but the tail 10 percent are above 225 LPCD, and their average consumption is 340. So, you have got a huge contrast between people who are at 340 liters per capita per day and half the population below 90, and so on. So, that the, that question of, of end of pipe equity, given that you are bringing all the water from the Kaveri, how is it actually distributed within Bangalore, is not a question that the SDG 6 is anywhere really asking you because saying, uh, uh, you know drinking water for all in some you know in what sense 25 lpcd or uh, you know 340 lpcd are we saying we're going to give 340 to all of them we're not even really talking about that and drinking water frankly is a, a sort of a nice mushy term which hides what are you talking are you talking about drinking water which is probably i need you know one uh, <coughs> one bottle a day or some maybe two bottles a day or are we talking about uh, domestic water and in that case we come to this kind of inequity so there's just one example of uh, the nature of equi equity that is important in the water sector, but there are many other layers to this question. So, how is what is fair distribution between farmers and the domestic sector? Uh, the last time when the uh, Kaveri uh, Tribunal Award was notified, finally, uh, the Mandya farmers who had always been targeting Tamilian farmers for taking too much water or something like that, finally turned on, turned on Bangalore and said that well, pumping from the Kaveri uh, for Bangalore is reducing availability for, of. Uh, irrigation water for the Mandya farmers for their sugarcane and, and paddy cultivation. So, uh, you know what is the fair distribution then of water between the farmers who are doing sugarcane, paddy or something else growing your food and domestic uh, consumption of water. What is fair between upstream and downstream whether it is Karnataka and Tamil Nadu, whether it is Chhattisgarh and Odisha or whether it is India and Bangladesh. What is what is fair distribution uh, and that, those are the kind of conflicts that we really see uh, you know all the time in our country, in our conti continent, subcontinent wherever you are. Uh, what is fair between polluters and polluters? So, on the one hand, we have laws which say that pollution is a crime, and so you have to actually put people behind bars. Uh, but then, criminal cases are very difficult to prove in court. So, the the KSPC, the analysis that we did of the Pollution Control Board's success in prosecuting people under this uh, this Water Act, they had 450 cases filed since the creation of the Pollution Control Board. Only 150 cases have been decided upon. And only 25 cases they have won, and they lost the remaining 125. Because in criminal cases, the level of evidence that the judges demand is so high 
most of the time the boards are not able to deliver that level of evidence in the case is dragging on, dragging on for a median of 6 7 years so what is then fair between polluters and polluters should you then take it off the criminal list and put it under the civil uh, law and so on and so forth uh, what is fair access to use of groundwater so uh, what does it mean in terms of when you have groundwater at 2000 feet who can afford to drill one more bore well which is perhaps likely to succeed at a 25% rate of success uh, and in, will require an investment of say 4 lakhs or 5 lakh rupees um, who will be able to actually afford to drill that bore well therefore who is actually having access to groundwater that becomes a really important question um, and the way we have been traditionally supplying water for whether it's agriculture or uh, domestic use is to build dams and invariably building dams means submerging some land so somebody is giving up their livelihoods in order to uh, supply water store and then supply water to somebody else so what is the fair distribution of benefits and costs so should they then be recipients of that water also will they get land in the command area of that dam they will never get that la land because land in the command area will be incredibly expensive so where are they going to be in terms of the distribution of benefits and costs who, ben who benefits who loses and what is a fair way of compensating the loser that i think a very central question to the water sector because a lot of water supply related activity involves these kinds of transformations uh, that involve some losers and some winners and overlaid on throughout this whole discussion about equity i would say all of this is still biophysical equity in the sense it's the very nature of water which connects people it's the very nature of water that you have to build dams and send water somewhere in, in that process submerge some land but overlaid on all of this is the question of social justice another layer which is the losers are not you know randomly distributed in society the losers typically are the weaker sections the guys who get the the polluted water are the are the weaker sections the people who lose their lands are in the uplands who are the adivasis who are living in the forests and those are the lands that typically get submerged, submerged with big dams and so on and so forth so you've got a whole uh, social injustice layer sitting on top of the biophysical injustice if there are uh, uh, powerful people for example in karnataka when i was just starting my master's work at the ministry of science the big success was the anti dam movement against the bedti project in the western ghats where they managed to actually stop stop the dam forever and when you analyze the movement and who was part of the movement it was a very rich set of arakanat farmers who were standing to lose their land due, due to submergence in that dam then they were successful in stopping that dam but the same thing didn't happen in the narmada case or in many other cases where uh, you know let's say poorer farmers were were all set to lose their land so there is a clear social justice dimension to all of this uh, so you might therefore want to conclude by saying that the sdg6 formulation of goals the the values that we should be expect you know overlaying the lenses through which we should look at water problems are inadequate and we really need sort of a development sustainability justice and democracy uh, uh, goals for the water sector and we need to really therefore have a multidimensional vision of what do we mean by a, a well managed water sector or the lenses through which we look at water problems need to cover all these angles we cannot only talk about adequacy we cannot only talk about sustainability we cannot only talk about uh, you know quality of water quality of water for whom for what use uh, delivered at what cost who pays that cost who can afford to pay that cost who cannot afford to pay that cost and so on and so forth so <clears throat> i think this might be a, a more uh, what shall we say uh, inclusive formulation of the goals that we might demand from the water sector and of course none of this is not value free just because we add more values to the to the mix does not make it value free it just makes it more likely to represent the kind of progressive goals that our constitution or our social processes have tried to set for ourselves as a country uh, or globally for 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 uh, the use of natural resources in general now when we come to the next question which is the use of science in explaining uh, why we have these problems so uh, we already had old solutions we had big dams and these these solutions continue to carry weight in the policy making sector now it's about being building dams to interlink rivers and transfer water over thousands of kilometers uh, but we also claim to have new solutions and the new solutions take the form have been taking the form of check dams you know built by the thousands uh, we it's been taking the form of planting trees so for example the latest was tetis koti uh, dhadalava in maharashtra uh, for whatever <coughs> magical uh, number that that uh, communicated to people uh, or of course maharashtra is a leader in continuous contour trenches so they have trenched the hell out of i think most slopes in the sayadri region elsewhere uh, and then the new ideas of tank desilting for example the 
jalayukt shivar uh, program where tank diesel thing and this is not restricted to maharashtra by any means when you look at the similar abhiyan in in telangana or you look at uh, karnataka diesel thing is the perennial favorite of all politicians and all contractors because uh, uh, silt is is gold in so many ways and river widening so you've got you know make rivers wider clear channels remove obstructions as a way of uh, solving the water problem uh, so broadly speaking you have uh, uh, measures that are about increasing recharge uh, and then there are measures about increasing storage which is desilting tanks widening rivers building more dams uh, and with different names and la the latest in the in the mix is kaveri calling by our jaggi vasudev from from koimbatore uh, what is missing in all of this really apart from many other dimensions the the social or the value dimension is missing perhaps or not well thought out but the hydrological science is really completely shaky in all of these uh, uh, recommendations so i just like to give some example one example from our work on trying to establish some rigorous causality and therefore unpacking what really is the explanation therefore what might work as a solution and might not work as a solution in the case study i'm going to share with you is the case study of the arkavathi rivers drying this is a river to the west of uh, bangalore it's a river that flows from the nandi hills past uh, this point which is about 30 kilometers due west uh, from the edge of bangalore and then eventually joins the kaveri so uh, we studied this uh, this project it was a multidisciplinary project bijav was part of that and we started with this question why is the arkavathi drying because a lot of activists had said that the river was drying and and we need to rejuvenate it somehow and they were already talking about various ways of rejuvenating it and we looked at the data the data are very clear the river has dried up so this is at the tg heldi dam which is a drinking water reservoir supplying water to bangalore basically after the 70s you see a very clear decline in the inflows into the reservoir and by the 90s and 2000 the levels were uh, the inflows were so low that the reservoir had stopped supplying any water at all from an original design of 150 million liters per day so the decline is clear and the nature of the decline also is clear that for example after the 1990s there's been not a single month where a non monsoon month you had any inflow of water into the river so there's no base flow as the hydrologists would call it the post monsoon flows have pretty much completely vanished uh, so what could be the reasons for this decline in the flows and we said let's put out all the reasons out there we did an expert consultation we reviewed the literature and we talked you know talked to various other people and said looks like there are basically five possible explanations for this decline in, in the inflows the the zero explanation which could have been a new dam built upstream which has, has caused the flows to decline is not true in this case there's no new dams since 1931 when that tgrd dam was built so the five possible reasons could be actual climate change declining rainfall that could be a reason you could have climate change in the form of increasing temperatures which are causing more evapotranspiration and therefore the water is disappearing uh, there could be loss to deep aquifers due to groundwater pumping so people are really pumping the groundwater the water out uh, increasing evapotranspiration due to changes in the vegetation uh, and finally possibly the blockages in the stream channel so as if blockages in stream channels and therefore sending bulldozers to clear them is one of the favorite explanations for why the river is dry drying that's very convenient and, and very simple intuitively makes sense that the river is blocked so these are the five possible reasons so we investigated them one by one we plotted uh, 60 years of of rainfall actually 70 years of rainfall there is no declining trend in the rainfall you plot the estimated potential evapotranspiration there is no significant increase in the uh, evapotranspiration that can account for the kind of loss that you're seeing from 150 million liters per day to almost zero right uh, so what remains not rainfall not temperature so you're left with the third explanation which was the blockages and when we actually walked the stream channels ourselves we found that the blockages were checked out so the blockages are not illegal encroachment of agriculture or people real estate wala is building something in the channel but they were actually check dams built under government programs agriculture department was building check dams watershed department was building check dam uh, you know uh, narega was building check dam everybody who was anybody was building check dams because that was a way to supposedly solve the water crisis for the farmers so these were the blockages in the stream channels uh, and there were this, these two other possible explanations that we further investigated and if you look at start with the question of land use change and look at what happened with the land use we did satellite image mapping for this over this whole period and what you see the just watch the perennial unirrigated plantation which is that pinkish color in the middle uh, so this is the 2013 status which to put it in a nutshell perennial unirrigated plantation is the code word for eucalyptus which had gone from 0% of the landscape to 20% of the landscape and mind you this is all private lands not in public lands this is not the for a change for a change this is not the forest department going crazy it's done that in other other parts of the state 
but this is people doing going crazy and people are obviously not crazy so they were doing it for a reason and the reason is that eucalyptus is a great crop for the individual farmer who's living next to a town wants to really give up farming and go and work in the city you put the land under eucalyptus and it's like a you know very safe crop no no cattle no fencing required no watch and ward required six years later the contractor comes and cuts the crop and and you can again have a next crop in another six years so eucalyptus has gone from zero to 20 percent in the catchment and the hydrological implications of having such a perennial uh, fast growing water intensive uh, tree crop are humongous uh, but the, the second point about the use of groundwater for other other kinds of agriculture is also very clear you can see that the uh, open wells had all gone the blue line and the bore wells are all gone up and the role of surface water in irrigation has, has completely disappeared so you've got and that is then further confirmed from the well census that we did in some milli watersheds where we actually went and talked to every farmer and mapped every bore well and what you see is basically the number of bore, well, bore wells keeps increasing the depth at which they are hitting water or striking the water keeps declining so they're going deeper and deeper before they can hit white water uh, yet the number of functioning bore wells has increased even though they have a 50 percent well failure rate so they are drilling more wells to comp in a sense compensate for the fact that half of them fail within a year or, or never reach any kind of yield uh, when they are drilled so that's the kind of yeah please so these were 2000 hectares to 5000 hectare scale areas where we could do a full census like every plot every farmer uh, every bore well we could gps we couldn't do it for a 1500 square kilometer uh, area <coughs> so so that we, we just picked a few strategically located uh, mini water fields um, and therefore if you then do the hydrological calculations you can see that groundwater extraction is exceeding recharge in most of the years the the hollow bars are the uh, the uh, the subtraction of of uh, recharge and, and extraction and you can see that in most cases it's running in the negative so uh, the net of groundwater extraction is more than the the recharge and though not surprisingly therefore you have groundwater levels now in the in this the the early catchment at 600 feet 800 feet 900 feet and therefore you have no base flows because if water there is no water uh, at the level of the stream channel there's never going to be any seepage of the groundwater back into the river so that's uh, the explanation for why the arkavati is dry the combination the interesting combination of declining groundwater levels because of eucalyptus and because of pumping and the pumping is for commercial crops like uh, vegetables that feed bangalore uh, i eat probably eat all those vegetables and uh, then when the groundwater level drops you do check damming and check damming looks like a solution and it is a temporary solution for the farmer but if the pumping keeps unabated then it's uh, in the long run it's just going to be more surface water going into groundwater and getting pumped out for agriculture so uh, it's not a not really uh, a solution so this this was the five hypothesis approach that we used to kind of track down the the problem and that has some larger lim uh, implication that i would like to share with you because it is not just for the arkavati or not just for this question of how we understand the hydrological cycle and the relationship between groundwater and surface water so if you look at this sort of schematic of how the hydrological cycle or this part of the land part of the hydrological cycle which is really that rain falls uh, some of it infiltrates the rest of it runs off as surface runoff the infiltrated amount largely is picked up by plants uh, and evapotranspired and a little bit of that then goes past the root zone as goes to groundwater recharge and the more important most important point is that groundwater recharge eventually goes out as groundwater discharge into the base flow because if that groundwater level over the years is at some stable equilibrium then obviously what come, came in has to go out somewhere and it's going out in the form of discharge into the rivers uh, as base flow so if you if you travel across the peninsular india and you see a river flowing in the middle of uh, the summer or in the middle of let's say january to april or january to may period all the flow in that you're seeing in the river is base flow which means it's water that actually infiltrated and then came out at some point somewhere now if you change that hydrological cycle through pumping artificial recharge or irrigated agriculture what are we doing so we are in pumping groundwater we are basically lowering the groundwater table and therefore cutting out base flows the, the uh, water table never intersects the stream so the stream might actually have to then feed the groundwater rather than the other way around when you build check dams what are we doing we are again reducing surface runoff and sending water into the ground and if that is coupled to pumping then again you basically lost that water from the uh, rest of the cycle you picked it up locally and finished it off so that's really what's going on in terms of the the interventions and the net result or the net direction in which that water is going is irrigated agriculture which means it's going as evapotranspiration or in the case of eucalyptus unirrigated agriculture where it's it's 
again a form of utilizing water for growing tree crops, vegetable crops, whatever it is that we want to grow uh, for evapor through evapotranspiration. So, that is evapotranspiration is really then the key, the key to understanding what's, what changes are happening in this uh, hydrological cycle across the peninsula. And what you see is the Kaveri Basin is closed which means in a normal year there is no net water outflow from the Kaveri to the Bay of Bengal. The Krishna Basin is closed which means no net outflow in a normal year except some crazy year like last year uh, flowing of water to the Bay of Bengal. And progressively the Godavari will go in the same direction and the uh, Mahanadi will go in the same direction and so on and so forth. So, th those are the challenges we are facing. Yes. So, uh, really the, there is no discharge, the rivers do not flow into the ocean? In these two cases, they do not, yeah, they have stopped. Because we have taken out all the water beforehand through dams and diversions and through pumping and are using it for evapotranspiration. That is one point. small question. Yes. What exactly is a check dam? How, what is a check dam? Yeah, so this is basically a structure that you build on a stream to hold some water with the idea that instead of allowing it to flow down hill, you hold it there and it will infiltrate and recharge the ground water. So, as you see in this particular case, it is defunct because it is not filled, even the check dam is not filled for a while because uh, there is no flow in the stream. So, there is probably 5 other check dams upstream of this check dam that are blocking any inflow into this check dam, but that is the idea of a, of a check dam. No, the, every check dam is designed on the basis of some calculation that the engineer supposedly has about its catchment area and therefore the runoff that they will get. But typically, they will not have thought of how many other check dams are upstream of that check dam in making that calculation. So, everybody is assuming that they are damming a pristine catchment. So, so everybody is building big check dams. Yes. The water flow side. This one? Okay, sorry. Yeah. What are these inflections? Like, what is inflow? But where is the? Yeah. So the the high inflow years are the high rainfall years, basically. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But then it seems like overall, uh, even the sort of up, after the inflection, yeah. I don't know what you call it, but that seems to have kind of gone down. Yes. Yes. So even what we are saying is that even in high rainfall years, the inflow is really not, uh, you know, barely reached the average in, average uh, inflow. Yeah. I mean, how does it recover? How does that? It seems to go up and then come back. No, no. So, these are, each of them is a different year and pretty much each year is decoupled from the other year, right? That at the end of the year, the uh, DJL dam is anyway dry because you moved all the water to Bangalore. So, it is uh, starting from zero almost every year in terms of what is coming in, yeah. So, uh, so the implications are beyond just the Arkavati as saying for the uh, understanding of our of the cycle, yeah. Sorry. So, uh, if the, those uh, years where the inflow was less, yes. were still high rainfall years. Uh, then, I mean, the hypothesis you have are all local hypotheses, right? evapotranspiration of that region where you are studying. So, what about the evapotranspiration of the area upstream, oh, sorry, downstream of, upstream of, sorry. No, no. So, we are, we are looking at evapotranspiration of the whole catchment, 1500 square kilometer catchment. And basically, for evapotranspiration to change, in the potential evapotranspiration to change, because of climatic factors, you would need a change in temperature which is very significant, but the tem temperature change you found is half a degree. So, that is not going to explain the kind of drop you are seeing from 150 MLD of average flow to 15 MLD of average inflow, right. Um, so, what are the implications of this? So, what it means is actually if you look at how we are even conceptualizing sustainable groundwater use, it calls into question even this conceptualization of, of sustainable groundwater use. Because when the Central Groundwater Board puts out some, uh, you know, notification like this, which says stage of groundwater development, how much of, what fraction of the recharge are you removing through pumping? And it says less than 70 percent is safe, 70 to 90 percent is still safe, semi-critical and then finally after 90 percent, you start talking about critical and over exploited. So, if you think about their visualization of groundwater, they are still thinking of groundwater like a bucket. So, recharge adds to the bucket, pumping removes from the bucket. As long as your pumping rate is less than the recharge rate, the bucket level will remain uh, constant or growing, so you will be fine. And only when pumping exceeds the recharge, that is when the bucket level will drop. But the previous uh, slide tells us that no, <coughs> even or the one before that tells that in a, in a natural uh, watershed itself, whatever comes in goes out. So, this it is not a bucket, it is a leaky bucket, it is a completely leaky bucket where it is just a delayed flow. Instead of flowing out right in, you know 3 days after the, the rain or 5 days after the rain, it is flowing out 4 months after the rain because it is going in and then coming out. So, it is a slow process, it is going in the soil, right. So, it is a delayed flow, it is still part of a flowing uh, 
river it's still part of the hydrological cycle which is a annual cycle and so all the re, all the renewable groundwater is really part of your surface flows because eventually it would have joined the surface flows if you start counting surface flows and recharge separately you are double counting because surface flow already had your base flows as, as long as the base flows were functioning and therefore by putting this we have already taken a call we have effectively said the downstream does not matter you do not they do not need base flows anything that is recharged I can grab in my area that is kind of the implicit assumption the value position that you are taking which is not right or wrong but it we need to be explicit is that what we want we want to say that all base flows can be grabbed by people upstream and they do not need to release any base flow water uh, to downstream users. So, the river can be dry once the monsoon is over is that what we sort of have in mind as our normative position um, and we have put this out in a paper saying we need to move away from the idea of just regulating groundwater to really thinking about regulating the integrated uh, water that is available in the watershed all the water that is falling and eventually going out and the, the sort of bottom line here of this hydrological story is there is no free lunch right. You build more check dams, it reduces runoff. You uh, direct artificial recharge to bore wells, again you are reducing surface runoff. You widen rivers, but there is nothing coming in. So, what is the point in widening? I keep saying the example of an empty cup. So, you have an empty cup like a small irrigation tank and now you made it a bigger empty cup because you made a bigger irrigation tank which you desilted it and made it deeper and all that. But there is nothing flowing in the first place, you never ask the question why. Uh, uh, you do farm ponds that is the other buzzword right farm ponds as way of solving farmers problems and yes they do solve farm problems locally, but we must recognize they reduce surface runoff again. And more interestingly as I think Joy's work other people's work Supercom's work other people's work has shown in Maharashtra farmers have very innovatively used farm ponds not to capture run runoff, but to pump groundwater from wells and store in farm ponds which are lined and then they can use it for uh, irrigating their farms throughout the dry season right. So, the farm ponds are part of your groundwater pumping cycle not really part of your uh, you know rainfall linked uh, uh, surface runoff cycle. So, it is a very innovative and different use of, of uh, farm ponds and of course, if you build new dams again you are obviously depriving uh, people downstream not to mention the displacement costs of these new dams and drilling new bore wells which means now even in the bucket model you are finishing off that uh, water level and you are down going heading towards 1000 and 2000 feet uh, of groundwater level that also has other implications as we as I said in the beginning equity implications. So, that at 2000 feet who has access and does not have access to groundwater. So, it is always about who is who has access to which water and, and how that is changed. And then the policy or science implications of this is that we should not be talking about sustainable groundwater, we should be talking about uh, fair utilization of the aggregate of surface and groundwater and you could add wastewater in areas where a lot of wastewater is generated you could add. Uh, the fair utilization of, of treated wastewater across all uses and users, which means we need to be doing water budgeting to understand where the rainfall ends up and who benefits from it. So, and as I said the biggest hole in our scientific understanding of the water cycle in India is evapotranspiration. What is really since we have diverted all the water where is the water going it is all going away from the river. So, there is no point in just measuring what is flowing in the river we need to be measuring where the diverted water ended up and eventually basically went up as evapotranspiration. And evapotranspiration is not easy to measure, uh, but we just have not invested anywhere near the resources that we have invested in building dams um, or drilling bore wells. I mean just not even a fraction of a percent of that has gone into estimating evapotranspiration. Now, let me quickly come to the social side of the story. So, we understand why uh, let us say the flows are declining in a hydrological sense. Do we understand why this is happening in a social sense? So, why do farmers behave in particular ways? Why do urban users behave in particular ways? that lead to these kinds of problems and since the array of problems is so vast from water pollution to urban water scarcity to uh, rural uh, uh, you know groundwater declines I would not be able to explain the whole story and the other thing that we confront when we try to do this kind of problem oriented research is the challenge of engaging different social science disciplines in this kind of explanation of problems and there the struggle is because the way the social sciences have evolved is different from the way the natural sciences have evolved. A uh, lot of competing theories, a lot of speaking at cross purposes, a lot of asking questions in a different way. So, some discipline might be asking questions about equity, and other disciplines are asking questions about efficiency or about you know aggregate uh, benefit or cost and so on. And so, they are starting from a very different uh, framing of the problem. The question that they are asking itself is different, it makes it the job little harder. To give you an example, so when you look at the uh, economics literature on urban water, the, I showed you the histogram of domestic water use in Bangalore. The urban water economist will never plot that histogram 
the urban water economist will say well you have people who are uh, who have let's say who are using water wastefully 320 liters per capita per day and the reason is the pricing is wrong and you need to charge more for that water that you are supplying them but what you actually see is a correlation if you look at who is using the water at 320 liters per capita and who is sitting at 60 liters per capita there is a very clear link between income uh, wealth and and that uh, uh, gradient and therefore what actually happens is many of the rich people are already playing, paying 60 rupees per capita per day because they live away from the center of Bangalore and those areas are not supplied with Kaveri water or with public supply water so they are buying tanker water because many of the bore wells have dried up and all of Whitefield filled with information technology uh, you know people with high salaries no water a Whitefield groundwater is gone so everybody is living off tanker water and tanker water is 80 rupees a kiloliter way above uh, our Kaveri water supply which is at 8 rupees a kiloliter 12 rupees a kiloliter 16 rupees a kiloliter so if you want to make them feel the pinch you would have to price water at 200 rupees a kiloliter if at all they might feel a pinch when you're earning a salary of 10 lakhs per month or something you might not even notice that and the other data that we showed in this is through the survey is that half of the people don't even know the price of water they are paying because it's all part of the annual maintenance charges of the apartment complex or you know uh, I'm renting the apartment from the landlord, landlord pays the water bill, I just paid as part of my rent and so on and so forth. So people don't know how much they're consuming, people don't even notice the bill because it's just such a small amount and so on. So if you want to do this kind of pricing based solutions, you will have to price water at 200, 300 rupees a kiloliter which is completely unaffordable for somebody who today is already at 60 rupees a, sorry at 60 LPCD. Now what is going to happen to them when water is priced at, at uh, 300 rupees a kiloliter, right? Uh, if you come to look at the question of irrigation water, you might say that the explanation that water being free is part of the problem is true. But the question is, you haven't asked why. Why is water free? Why is the canal uh, a command farmer paying such a low price for water and is price the only problem? But even if you said it was one of the big problems, why is it so free? Why are we uh, facing these huge inequities? What is the source of these huge inequities in the, in the urban sector? You might actually say that political economy perspectives have a better explanatory power in the sense who is winning, who is losing or who is getting water, what power do they exert in influencing those decisions. So if you look at who are the winners in the water sector, you have got canal command farmers, you have got deep borewell owners, you have got contractors and of course you have got the project managers of those who build 5000 crore pipelines or you know 10,000 crores interlinking of rivers and, and stuff like that. And the losers are, the, are landless marginal farmers, rural domestic sector. Uh, urban slum dwellers who have no say in the distribution of water. So the political economy of water clearly uh, explains why you get this kind of a distribution of water across the board. Uh, but to go deeper in terms of understanding for example questions of lack of attention to sustainability or lack of attention to other forms of equity, you might want to dig deeper into also a sort of the more institutional framework that, that guides the water sector and one of the dimensions is the legal framework and if you look at the legal framework. Uh, the, the nature of legislation, the distribution of property rights over water. You could also look at the organizational framework, you could look at what is the nature of governance today itself, what is the orientation of water departments in, in, our, in our governments. Uh, they are focusing on production and not on regulation of water. What is the scale at which they function? What is the level of transparency and accountability that they have? What is the level of voice and representation that water users have uh, in the functioning of these agencies? And to what extent are they integrating any kind of you know more recent, more uh, better quality uh, knowledge, whether it is uh, natural science knowledge, engineering knowledge, or social science knowledge in their decision making? So if you start with the property rights question, you will find that while surface water is state property, groundwater is open access de facto uh, private property. So if you own a piece of land, it can just be this area that I'm standing on. If I can sink a bore well and I can drill out as much water or pump out as much water as I want. That's the de facto status although the, there are states that like Karnataka have passed a groundwater regulatory authority act and you look at the act it says there's going to be a groundwater regulatory agency so you go looking for that agency and as we say in in Canada address a illa so uh, you don't you will not even find their address anywhere uh, they are somewhere sitting in part of the groundwater directorate and the last meeting was three years ago and the minutes of the meeting were about charging people 50 rupees demand draft to report their bore well to the agency so that's the level of the uh, regulatory authority. If you look at the nature of legislation, uh, most of the laws in the water sector are enabling legislation, not obligations on the state. So even in a 
what a BWSSB Act, the Bangalore Water Supply and Sewerage Act. It enables the state to set up an agency and the agency may deliver water to people. But it does not specify what are the goals for that agency. Is it 50 liters per capita per day? Is it 100? Is it 100? It will have, that's not in the law. Those are, you know, occasional norms that the government might announce that we hope to supply something of this kind. So, look at the Irrigation Act. Again, no obligations. It's about enabling, enabling setting up of dams, canal, canals and so on and so forth. And in the, in the Irrigation Act, for example, implicitly, the water rights go with the land rights. So, which means if you're a big farmer, you get more water than if you're a small farmer. And that's just built into the whole uh, piece of legislation. If you look at what are the agency structures they create in order to actually then implement canal irrigation, right? They are called Niravari Nigam. In, in Karnataka, they are called Niravari Nigam Limited. And uh, supposedly every basin or every large project has its own Niravari Nigam. Uh, and look at who is the CEO, what is the governing board, what is the nature of staffing, to just give you an example of the staffing. The entire water resources department, which is the uh, used to be PWD and split into water and so on, has 5,000 engineers, 30 surface water hydrologists, 30 groundwater hydrologists, and zero social scientists, right? And this is a state in which 50% of irrigation is happening through groundwater. And the number of groundwater hydrologists, this is, these are not hydrologists, mind you, there are 30 positions in the groundwater directorate. Uh, so they could be also include the pune and the director uh, all combined, right? So that's the level of investment we have made in terms of staffing this sector, whereas you've got 5,000 engineers, because the paradigm of the water sector is still the 1950s paradigm, ki pani to behra hai. it's going, you know, in the rivers, waste, and the job of water department is to somehow build structures, build infrastructure to bring water away from the river to where people are living, whether it is Bangalore that is 100 kilometers away from the Kaveri or Pune, which is downstream of Khadakwasla Dam or Panchet Dam or something like that, and so on and so forth. The whole focus was supply side engineering. And which may have been reasonable in the 1950s or 1930s or whatever when uh, our uh, Param Pooja Vishweshwaraya built the first, you know, Krishna Raj Sagar Dam on the Kaveri and so on. But today we are in a completely different paradigm where we have wiped out all the rivers or on the, on the way to closing most of the basins. We have wiped out the groundwater resource in much of the peninsula and we are still talking about a supply side framework. That we have to somehow get water from somewhere, which is completely uh, out of date. Uh, the staff, of course, are not accountable to any particular, it's called a corporation, but the staff are not, you know, really tied to any corporation. They rotate all over the place. The CEO is an IS officer. The chairman of the board is an IS officer who comes and goes every two, three years. The governing board has a random set of uh, governed bureaucrats mostly on it. And the most important thing, how does the uh, Niravari Nigam, which, which manages the dam and the canal network, interface with its key stakeholder, which is the canal command farmers. So they have something called an irrigation consultative committee. And if you look at the composition of the committee and the way that committee functions, the chair of that committee is not from the command. He's the MLA, local MLA. So, uh, the members of that committee are not necessarily from the command. They'll be important farmers that the MLA appointed to that committee, right? And so it's not a negotiation between the dam owner and the farmer who's going to be the recipient of the irrigation water. It's some random mixture of, of political, uh, politically powerful individuals that are doing that negotiation. Uh, and so a lot of this analysis of the legal, the administrative and the fiscal policies that are in Karnataka went into the making of this uh, report that is, I hear, I just heard two days ago, actually gone to the cabinet. We were really thinking that it might go into the dustbin, but uh, it's actually gone to the cabinet in some form. Uh, and the key strategies that we have recommended, they go beyond the water sector. And we recommend that we also should be looking at what's driving, for example, sugarcane and paddy based agriculture in the, uh, you know, in the irrigation sector, which is because we have subsidies for sugarcane, we've got MSP for paddy, that's what really drives all that production. We should be moving those MSPs, moving those incentives to ragi and jowar, which were our traditional uh, low water consuming crops of Karnataka anyway. Uh, uh, we should be reviving uh, participatory irrigation management in these command areas through by revamping the irrigation acts, uh, restructuring that link with the NNLs, and doing a combination of tank, groundwater, and watershed management through a statute on uh, how do we sort of restructure or create institutions at the village, the milli watershed and the, and the basin level in terms of, of integrated urban water, water management also in the urban area. So uh, do ward level uh, management of, of water supplies, including wastewater in these areas uh, and so on. And so really the focus at the end of the whole uh, report has been heavily also on this issue of legal administrative and, and fiscal reform. And the last point, not cannot, it can't be the tail sort of wagging the dog, but the role of knowledge and information. Because today, even today, 
the perspective of people who gather data on water is that they are gathering it for government and therefore they will only supply it to government and the public is an interloper and the public has no right to this data right and so there is no attempt to put this data out and, and actually analyze it in any meaningful way. So that is also part of that small story of how we are running these uh, institutions. So to summarize what I am trying to say here is that we need a real paradigm shift in a, in a multiplicity of ways from a sort of demand uh, supply side management to demand side management from fragmented management that had focused only on surface water to integrated management uh, from thinking of depleted groundwater for a few effectively by saying groundwater is a private resource and whoever can access to it will access it to restore groundwater for all uh, from an exclusive engineering approach to a more uh, holistic approach of linking the social and the uh, ecological, hydrological and so on. Uh, holding the water as a commons in the public trust and I think the last but perhaps the most important point which is from in a state like Maharashtra with water population of 8 crores, uh, 9 crores uh, which is the size of a European nation. State of Karnataka with 6 and a half crores, six and a half crores the size of a mid-sized European nation. But we say that all water management is a state subject and it will happen at the state level but nothing below that. So, we really need to move towards a much more deeply democratic, we can say it is democratic in the sense we have an elected legislative assembly and they uh, you know the water managers are supposedly reporting to the state legislature but or the ministers but really this is a very shallow and top down way of managing water resources which are in a, in a diverse and, and highly complex uh, socio hydrological landscape like Maharashtra, Karnataka you name it right. So, the only way I think we can address that political economy question of changing the way as to who wins and who loses will have to be by deepening the democratic structure of, of the water sector. And that might be a beginning, I am not saying that is necessarily solving all problems, but in a uh, in the framework that we live in, I think only by, by strengthening the democratic process around these resources, by really decentralizing decision making downward, having an enabling framework for making those decisions binding, we might move towards addressing some of these political economy questions. Thank you.